Elizabeth McLeod. Uh, Elizabeth is a registered dietitian currently working in the multi-organ outpatient transplant clinic at Toronto General Hospital. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition and Dietic Dietics from uh, Western University and has completed her dietic internship at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre, including intensive clinical rotations in oncology, uh, neurotology, critical care, and general medicine. Elizabeth has worked with patients striving for general health, weight loss, improved digestion, diabetes management, and a host of other goals. She has completed training, including craving change, cognitive behavior program design to help individuals become more aware of their eating triggers. She believes in a food first client center approach. Thank you very much. And um, welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And thank you for that great introduction. That was so nice. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth. I am, as Sharon said, the outpatient multi-organ transplant dietitian with the Ajmerit Transplant Center at Toronto General. Um, my presentation today is just going to cover ways to manage the side effects of the multiple medications that patients are sometimes on with interstitial lung disease. And we're going to be focusing on how to use nutrition to your benefit in that regard. Some of these medications that you might have heard of previously are OFEV, Esbriot, and a whole bunch of others as well. So a brief overview of our topics today. We're gonna to start by briefly talking about why nutrition is so important in lung disease. Then we'll move on to the various side effects of these medications and how they can be well managed using nutrition. We're then gonna talk about the importance of maintaining a healthy weight um, with uh, interstitial lung disease. And we're also going to talk about why it's important pre and post transplant. And um, we're gonna wrap up with a quick Q&A, talk about eating well and uh, address any questions that you have at that point. Okay, so first of all, uh, why is nutrition so important? Nutrition, just like exercise, medications, good mental health, a very good support system, it's an important part of disease management, whether it's interstitial lung disease or any other disease as well. Whether you're sick or not, good nutrition will give you the energy that you need to breathe, to fight infection, to cope well with your illness and day-to-day -day life, to maintain or improve your weight and your strength, as well as carry out activities of daily living like getting dressed, preparing food, spending time with friends and family. So medications are another very important part of disease management. And with ILD, often antifibrotic agents are prescribed. So these are things like OFAB and Esbriot. And these are designed to help slow the progression of the lung scarring or fibrosis that occurs in ILD. So although these medications are very important to the disease management, they unfortunately are not without side effects. And some of the most common side effects that we're gonna be covering today are nausea, vomiting, reflux or heartburn, low appetite, weight loss, as well as diarrhea. So uh, these are obviously not uh, pleasant symptoms. However, they can be managed in a variety of different ways. It's very important to manage them effectively just so that other components of your health are not impacted like your weight or your nutritional status. So we'll start by talking about nausea. The last thing that anybody wants to do when they're feeling nauseous is eat, but it is very important that you keep up your intake even when you are feeling nauseous. Some tips to help with this include having small, more frequent meals and snacks throughout the day, rather than very big meals just a couple times. Um, making sure that your stomach is never totally empty can also help with nausea. So having something to munch on close by at all times is a good strategy. It's best to focus on bland foods, foods that are very easy to digest. Uh, so things like white rice, boiled potatoes, dry cereal, just having that on hand to kind of snack on, dry crackers or toast, cream of wheat, or even a low salt chicken or veggie broth can be good ideas. Um, keeping a sleeve of crackers by your bed is a good tip, just so that you can have something to eat before getting up in the morning and starting your day, again, to make sure that your stomach doesn't get too, too empty. And avoiding spicy foods, greasy foods, or overly sweet foods is also a good tip. Any food that has a very strong taste or smell can trigger nausea and sometimes even staying out of the kitchen when, uh, when cooking foods and avoiding those smells can help. 
foods that help to decrease nausea are things like ginger and peppermint. So drinking ginger ale, ginger tea or peppermint tea, or even sucking on peppermint candies or gum can help. Once you're feeling a little bit better, your nausea is not as severe, you can start to move away from those very bland foods and add in things like light soups, chicken soups, vegetable soup, leaner meats like fish, poultry, any kinds of meats that you like, and even some low fat milk, yogurt, and cheese if you feel that you can tolerate it. Some other strategies include recognizing your triggers, like specific foods that trigger nausea for you, because everyone's going to be a little bit different. Um, you can also try eating foods cold or at room temperature, opening windows or using a fan when you're cooking to kind of air out the space. And as I mentioned before, having someone else cook for you and staying out of the kitchen so you're not getting those strong smells. So often with nausea, sometimes vomiting occurs. This is one time that it's actually important to stop eating and you want to do that for at least 30 minutes just to let things kind of settle. After that initial 30 minutes, you can start to add in some clear fluids just to make sure that you're not getting dehydrated. That's super important to keep, uh, keep under account as well. So this could be things like water, low salt broth, jello, popsicles, juices, and also soft drinks. And it's best to kind of let those soft drinks get nice and flat before you have those. Um, after this, you can start to add in some of those bland foods that we talked about before. So things like crackers, mashed potatoes, bananas, white bread and rice, noodles or pasta, and then oatmeal and cream of wheat as well. I often think of the acronym BRATS to remember these foods. So that stands for bananas, rice, applesauce, toast, and soup. So just those nice bland foods that you can kind of move towards once you're feeling a little bit better. The next step or step number four here is adding back some of those protein rich foods. So this is things like chicken, eggs, fish, tofu, nuts and seeds, as well as legumes. And then the last thing you want to add back, save this till very last, is dairy products like milk, yogurt, cheese, cottage cheese, any other um, milk products that you can tolerate. It's also very important to get in touch with your coordinator or a member of your healthcare team if you're noticing that you can't keep down anything like water, food, and especially your pills, because those are important medications. Um, important to let someone know if there's blood or a coffee ground texture to your vomit, or if you have very severe stomach pain or headache, um, if you're weak, dizzy, very confused, and if your nausea is very severe, you can also talk to your team about taking an anti-nausea medication. That's also an option. Okay, so let's move into a little bit about reflux and heartburn, which is just that feeling that you get of burning in your esophagus sometimes. Um, tips to help with this are again, small, more frequent meals and snacks, just to make sure that you're not overfilling your stomach too, too much. Eating and drinking very slowly is also important. Chewing food very well before swallowing. Limiting spicy and acidic foods like tomatoes, citrus fruits, vinegar and others, anything very acidic can sometimes irritate the esophagus. Um, limit or eliminate alcohol and caffeine, that can also help as it can cause or worsen reflux. And limiting fatty foods or choosing lower fat options is another great strategy. Um, fatty foods or things that are deep fried can actually worsen reflux. Also important to not eat one to two hours before lying down or going to bed as that can give you some time to digest the food before you're lying down so it's not with gravity going into your esophagus. And then also identifying your own triggers is important. So I often recommend to patients to keep a running list of foods that you notice tend to trigger um, any reflux for you. And that way you can know what to avoid in the future without all the guessing. Some people find that garlic and onions can lead to heartburn. problem. So identifying your own triggers can be a very useful strategy. A very common symptom with antifibrotics like OFEV and Esbriot. Um, when having diarrhea, it's important to ensure that you're hydrating very well. You don't want to get too dehydrated since you are losing a lot of fluid. Drinking eight to 10 cups of clear fluids throughout the day, make sure that you're staying well hydrated. And clear fluids are things like water, juice, and broth, but you can also turn to liquidy foods. So things like jello, popsicles, uh, anything that's clear and is a fluid-like consistency. 
avoid caffeinated beverages like coffee, tea, or sodas as they can actually make diarrhea worse. And for each loose bowel movement that you have, make sure to drink an additional one cup of fluid just to replace those losses. When you're having diarrhea, you're also losing quite a lot of electrolytes. So this is minerals like sodium or potassium. To replace these minerals, you wanna go for foods that contain them. So for sodium, that would be things like chicken or veggie broth, soups with a little bit of salt, crackers and pretzels. And then for the potassium, going for foods like potatoes, bananas, oranges, and also fruit juices can be helpful. You're also welcome to drink rehydration agents like Pedialyte, Gatorade, or Powerade, as these contain electrolytes that can help to replenish the losses as well. Foods to avoid when having diarrhea, as we kind of touched on a little bit, are anything that's fried or very greasy, um, rich desserts, anything that's very dairy heavy, whole grains or raw vegetables, fruits with thick peels as well, because all those have quite a lot of fiber in them and they can actually worsen diarrhea. And uh, nuts and seeds are another one that you kind of want to avoid. Choosing lower fat dairy products can sometimes be okay if you feel that you're tolerating those. Refined grains, so white grains. Oat fiber is the one exception to the to the fiber rule just because it's a different kind of fiber that can actually help to bind your stools. So that's an okay one to go for if you're having trouble with diarrhea. Cooking vegetables as well can help to break down that fiber a little bit. So that's a great option. Applesauce and nut butters are also good because those are broken down a little bit more and uh, they're, they're much easier for you to digest. Again, going back to the small frequent meal and snacks, that's kind of a running theme, but that's a really good tip for managing all these symptoms. Avoiding milk products if you find that they're worsening your diarrhea and also asking for anti-diarrhea medications is also an option. So things like Imodium or Metamucil are, are ones that you can turn to. So next, coping with loss of appetite. This is also a fairly common symptom. Often patients find that their appetite is lower than they're used to or than they've noticed in the past and they just don't really feel like eating. So in this case, it's really important to treat food like medicine. So eat even if you're not feeling hungry and eating on a schedule, keeping a routine can be helpful for this. So make sure that you always eat your three meals per day, have them at regular times and don't wait until you're hungry to eat because that might never happen or it might not happen often enough to keep your nutrition up. When people don't feel hungry, they do often forget to eat since the cue for eating isn't there. So setting alarms on your phone or asking someone that you live with to remind you to, to eat meals can be helpful for that. And at times when your appetite is low, don't worry too much about eating the right thing or the healthiest thing. It's more about going on for what tastes good and what you're actually interested in eating. And you can worry about the, um, the health effects later on. So going for whatever foods can keep your energy up is the way to go. For example, if you really want cookie dough ice cream, that's the only thing that sounds tasty at the time, that's totally fine. As long as you're getting some nutrition in, it's gonna be better than nothing. Um, have your largest meal at the time of day when you're feeling the most hungry. Um, if you feel the most hungry in the morning, then that's the time you want to have your biggest meal, or maybe it's around four o'clock when you're starting to get hungry, have your biggest meal then, even if it's not an actual meal time. And another tip is to keep high calorie and high protein snacks around the house to have throughout the day. This is something that I like to refer to as bang for your buck nutrition. So making sure that any food that you choose is as packed with nutrition as possible. So for example, instead of having just regular yogurt, go for Greek yogurt that has a little bit more protein. Instead of skim milk or 1% milk, go for 2% or the homogenized 3.25% just to bump up the nutrition a little bit. If you're having toast, put peanut butter on there or butter or add a little teaspoon of oil to your soup just so that every bite you have is as optimized as possible. Nutrition supplements like Ensure or Boost are another good tool to top up when you're having a hard time getting enough nutrition. And I actually often suggest that patients eliminate water from their diets when they're having a hard time getting in nutrition and just replace it with something else that will give them that hydration. So milk, smoothies, juice, Ensure or Boost. And even taking your pills with Boost or Ensure can be a good way to increase your intake without too much effort. All right, so now we're gonna move into a little bit of a review on why maintaining a healthy weight is so important. So quality of life can be negatively impacted whether you're overweight or if you're underweight. 
Being overweight can make breathing more difficult. It can increase your risk of comorbidities, including diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and others. Being underweight can decrease your energy levels and make day-to-day -day life more challenging, as well as make you more susceptible to infections. And the way that we calculate whether you're at a healthy weight is using something called body mass index or BMI, which you might've heard of in the past. And this is just a simple way of calculating your weight and height. You can find a simple calculator for these online. They're pretty easy to find. For the general population, the recommended healthy BMI range is 18.5 to 24.9 for adults aged 18 to 64 and 22 to 27 for adults over 65. For transplant, we're a little bit more lenient and we require your BMI to be between 17 and 27 with a maximum of 30 for listing. And this is just because of a whole bunch of research that's been done previously that shows that the outcomes of transplant are much better and patients are much safer during and after surgery if they're within this BMI range. So eating well for a healthy weight. It's important to note that everyone's nutritional needs are a little bit different. Everyone's body is a little bit different, so there's definitely no one-size-fits-all approach to this. Um, your healthcare provider or registered dietitian can work with you to help find ways for you to eat that work well for you and for your body. In general, following Canada's food guide or the plate method is a great way to ensure your meals are nice and balanced and you're getting all the nutrition you need to support your health. This is a picture of Canada's food guide. It actually came out back in 2016. It looks a little bit different from the old guide that had those colored bars and it talked about servings a lot. I actually like this one a lot better, and that's just because it doesn't require any measuring to follow. You can really just look at your plate and get a good idea of how your nutrition is just based on that. So I recommend that half of your plate is full of fruits and vegetables, a quarter is full of lean proteins. So we have lentils here, yogurt, eggs, and then meat products, nuts, tofu, tempeh. And then the last quarter can be full of whole grains. So brown bread, rice, pasta, quinoa, just to make sure you're getting good fiber in. And this guide really allows you to balance your plate pretty quickly and pretty easily. So this slide is a whole bunch of resources that you can take a look at kind of on your own time. We have how to calculate your BMI, manage nausea and vomiting, um, all the other symptoms that we talked about here, nutrition in general for ILD, increasing calories and protein. And then we also have a copy of the food guide there at the bottom. And I will happily send this out later on so that all those resources are nice and available to you. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope you learned something or you're feeling a little bit more prepared to deal with the potential side effects of the various medications that we talked about today. And if anyone has questions or anything like that, I'm more than happy to answer them at this time. Okay. So while we're waiting for some people to type in their uh, questions in the Q&A, uh, I have a couple of questions that people have sent me in advance. So one of the things that they wanted to know, Elizabeth, is, you know, um, after being diagnosed and being put on to antibiotic drugs, um, some people have expressed that they, they feel like things taste different and, um, and they're not sure why. It just, you know, things just don't taste good at all. Yeah. That's a super common symptom. I actually hear that a lot. And it could be a, a whole bunch of factors going into that. A lot of the time, some of these medications that you're on can make your taste buds change and you're not going to like things that you liked previously, or just the progression of the disease as well can have that effect. So for that, I definitely would say don't force yourself to eat anything that you don't like and really just be prepared that those changes can happen and that's okay. So staying away from those foods again is a, totally a fine option. And if you don't like chicken, going for another kind of protein that can supplement that. Um, staying out of the kitchen so you're not smelling those foods as well can be helpful. But overall, just knowing that that is totally normal, nothing to be too concerned about, and just choosing the foods that do taste good to you just to make sure your nutrition is nice and good. Okay. Uh, someone wanted to ask, when you're taking meds like the antifibrotic pills, um, should you take the medication in the middle of the meal or at the end of the meal? That is also a great question. So medications, it does sometimes depend on, you know, what your doctor tells you or your pharmacist tells you when to take them. So listening to them kind of first and foremost is good. Um, often taking medications after a meal can be helpful just to kind of negate some of those side effects like the nausea and vomiting. Just because having a little something in your stomach is going to make you a little bit more stable and help you to digest it a little bit better. 
So after a meal is great if you're feeling a little bit nauseous, but overall really just focusing on what your doctor or your, uh, your pharmacist tells you is the way to go. Okay. And Elizabeth, can you um, help us to understand? Uh, some people were asking, you know, when they're on different types of drugs, sometimes um, they'll develop an allergy that they've never had before. Is that common? And um, does it ever go away? Yeah, so that is definitely something as well that no need to be concerned about that. It does happen sometimes. Um, everyone's a little bit different, like was mentioned previously. Your nutrition's a little bit different. Your body can react differently to medications. So it's sometimes those allergies do last, sometimes they don't. So talking to your doctor about those um, and, and kind of seeing how things go day by day is the way to go for that. Okay. And what about the diets uh, that are outside of North America? Uh, many of our patients come from different cultures and uh, sometimes they feel like the, the food they're eating, it's just not working uh, for them. They just seem to have more reactions. So they're not understanding why. Yeah. I think that's something that we all as healthcare providers have to be very sensitive to is that everyone comes from a different background and we all have different foods that we're used to and different diets. Um, overall, again, I like that plate method just because it does make it so easy to slot in the foods that you do like. And that way you can balance your plate with good fruits and veggies, good protein, whatever that might be, depending on your culture or the kinds of foods that you do like. And then also those fiber rich foods in that other quarter. So yeah, kind of finding the foods that you enjoy and that you're used to and that your culture is kind of it's kind of the kind of the way to go for that and making sure to balance your plate regardless of what foods you're choosing. Okay. And Elizabeth, someone wanted to know how they go about accessing a nutritionist or a dietitian like yourself. Um, you know, where could they find someone and would everybody understand how to help them um, because they're on these antifibrotic drugs? Yeah. So if you do have ILD or one of these one of these issues, it's definitely good to talk to your doctor. A lot of programs will have a dietitian connected, or they can refer you to one that they trust. If you're having trouble with that, you can always go to the Dietitians of Canada website, and you can actually search for a dietitian by region, depending on where you are. Um, finding someone that does virtual versus in-person service is also possible with that. And then also, it will usually tell you their specialties. So you can find someone that specializes in digestive issues or in nutrition for breathing disorders. So it's definitely possible to find someone that will be suitable for you. Okay. And um, someone uh, is asking, they have been experiencing really bad diarrhea, very watery, and mm -hmm. they have an IBD as well as pulmonary fibrosis. And they found that it was just, their diarrhea was just getting worse uh, since getting the COVID vaccination. Mm. Is there a, this, any evidence of this occurring, do you, do you think? And that's a good question. I mean, when it comes to the COVID vaccine, I'm not totally sure, and I don't want to make any assumptions. So I've definitely not done my research on that. Um, but sometimes after, you know, with an illness or with a vaccine or things like that, definitely some of those symptoms can worsen. And it is also so challenging to manage two different diseases at the same time. So you mentioned IBS and then the ILD as well, that's definitely a challenge. And finding a dietitian that is educated in both those things can be helpful for that. Um, letting your physician know that you're having a lot of trouble with this and it's impacting your intake can also be helpful. And they can maybe suggest some supplements that you could be taking or some medications to help with that. That's another area that that oat fiber or metamucil, that extra fiber can help to bind the diarrhea a little bit. So that's something you could try out. Um, but overall, checking in with your doctor and letting them know that this is a big problem for you can be helpful. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, a couple of people were asking, you know, when they take their, their medications, sometimes um, when, they, when they take it, like they find it hard to swallow. Yeah. And so is there anything that they can take with any type of food that might help them easier to swallow or take those medications? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when it comes to that, sometimes having, having medication with a lot of liquid can be helpful. So having some liquid before and then medications and then having liquid after. Even mixing your medications into foods, if you're able to crush them, definitely check with your pharmacist first, but some medications can be crushed. Crush them up, you could put them in yogurt, applesauce, pudding, something like that. Um, if they can't be crushed, eating them with food at the same time 
mid meal, if that kind of works for you, that's also an option. But yeah, sometimes just having something with the medication can be helpful rather than just trying to have them on their own. Okay. Uh, someone had sent in to, if you're able to give some other suggestions of some diet uh, things that they could try out some food, um, they have found that sometimes um, in the mornings um, before they take their medication that uh, they take a spoonful of peanut butter first, let it sit for 20 minutes, and then they take their medication. It seems to help them. Are there any other foods that, you know, might do the same thing to maybe coat their stomach or something? Yeah, that's such a great suggestion. I love the idea of the peanut butter because that is some really good protein. Again, like you mentioned, it does kind of coat your stomach and not taking medications on an empty stomach can be helpful with some of the symptoms. So I think peanut butter is a great one. Um, anything shelf stable that you can keep beside your bed, I find to be nice and helpful. So, you know, crackers, um, even like an unopened jar of applesauce if that's something that you like, um, pretzels, anything that can kind of stay by your bed so you can wake up a little bit, have your crackers or anything, and then you're kind of good, good to go for the day. But I think the peanut butter is a great idea or almond butter if you like it as well. Okay. And uh, this person wanted to know, what about things like oatmeal? Is there anything to that as well? Yeah. Um, oatmeal can be good because it is pretty easy to swallow. There's really good, there's some protein in there, but there's really good fiber as well. So that can sometimes help to bind the diarrhea if that's an issue for you. And it also does, you can kind of customize it a little bit based on what you like. It's pretty easy to cook and doesn't smell too much. So it can help with that nausea a little bit. And again, yeah, that does kind of coat your stomach as well. So another great thing to have in the morning if that's an issue. Okay, someone um, just told me that, um, that they actually take a little bit of meat protein. They do 20 ounces of chicken uh, in the morning. Is, is that okay? Absolutely, yeah, whatever works well for you. Uh, again, everyone's really different. So if that's something that you find really, really helpful, then definitely go for it. I think that's a great idea. Okay, and you know, in your presentation, you said to avoid things like caffeine, like coffee, tea, um, alcohol. Um, you know, those are all things really difficult to give up. Um, how can, you know, one sort of add a little bit of that to their diet so it doesn't, you know, give nausea or some of the other conditions, but at least allow them to enjoy, you know, it at least every once in a while. Yeah, that's definitely also something that is really important to think about because you don't want to eliminate all the things that you really enjoy. So again, everyone's really different. Finding out what things affect you negatively and what things are okay Maybe a small amount of caffeine in the morning is okay for you. Maybe it's not. Maybe you can stay just like you have in the past, having two cups of coffee a day and you're totally fine. That's also, that's good as well. Kind of whatever works for you in that regard. So small amounts are okay, just depending. Um, for alcohol, we do recommend that you stay under the safe drinking guidelines for Canada. So that's less than 15 drinks per week for men. For men, no more than three per occasion and less than 10 for women, no more than two per occasion. Again, seeing if that affects you negatively or if it's okay, really just finding your individual tolerance is important. So some experimentation is sometimes in order. Okay, uh, so I wanted to ask, what's the purpose of, of journaling your food consumption? Like, how, how do you work on that? Like, do, how do you eliminate it or add to it? Um, just a bit of a general confusion. Yeah, so I think that the idea of keeping a food journal is really smart just because that way it's so much easier to track what you're eating and remember what you're eating. And sometimes I tell people to write down what symptoms they're having after eating as well. Cause then it's so much easier to find patterns and kind of correlate things to each other. Like maybe you notice that every time you have chocolate, you have diarrhea it's so much easier to see than just kind of trying to remember off the top of your head. Um, and then also if you notice that certain foods give you reflux, keeping a running list can be good just so that you can refer back to it and you know which foods to avoid. Um, I often recommend, I can always send out a template, but finding some kind of template and keeping it by your fridge or in your kitchen so that it's readily available and kind of jogs your memory to, to write it down and not waiting until that the night of to write everything down at once, kind of doing it after everything you eat so that everything is nice and accurately placed in there. But I think overall having a template can, can be really helpful for that and also having it visible so that you remember. 
thing. Uh, Elizabeth, you had suggested certain foods that people could keep by their bedside if they, mm -hmm. if they didn't help them. Um, what about when traveling? Because a lot of people have a um, hard time traveling when they're experiencing diarrhea or other or nausea or other symptoms uh, due to taking their medication. Like, what would you say to somebody? What should they keep in their bag that's handy? That's a great question too. Yeah, I think being prepared in that case is really important. Knowing that you're going to be taking a long journey, stocking up on those foods that you can take with you in your bag or in your purse can be helpful. Um, my brain always goes to things like trail mix. So mixing up a trail mix with, you know, maybe some dry cereal, some nuts, maybe some chocolate chips if you'd like to, or taking a sleeve of crackers with you. Granola bars are really easy and convenient as well. And another good thing about those booster Ensure nutritional supplements is that they're super portable. And as long as you haven't cracked the top, those are shelf stable. So you can toss one in your bag on your way out. And it's a really good way to get in some nutrition and something into your stomach as you're on the go. Okay. Uh, someone also wanted to ask you, you know, when you're buying these things and you know how they have the nutritional values at the back, the calories, the sodium content and everything, are there anything that you think you would recommend people to keep an eye out for to not uh, purchase because, you know, although there are different trail mixes of all sorts, like, is there ones that you would say, you know what, if it contains the following things, you should try to avoid that because it might, you know, upset your stomach or, or cause you some other, um, you know, pains down the road. Yeah. Yeah. So again, individual tolerance is kind of the best way to go for this choosing items that have worked for you in the past or finding a, a selection of things that you enjoy and that you know are that make your body feel good can be helpful. Um, I definitely recommend making sure to find foods that have pretty low sugar. So you can always look at the nutrition facts table and, and look at the amount of sugar in it. I used to have a rule of thumb for how many grams per serving I like to stay under, um, but I can definitely send that out later. When it comes to things like sugar and you know fat and things, you want to look for a percentage that's under, I think it's under 15%, um, means that it's kind of a little, and if it's more than 15, then it's a lot. So good things would be, you know, sodium and potassium if you're having trouble with diarrhea, fiber is a good one to look for, and then you want to go for the lower salt, lower sugar options. So looking at that percent daily value can be helpful when looking for things that are under 15 for the salt and the sugar. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know, they're, um, you know, being considered for a lung transplant, they're having a difficult time in losing the weight, because they're breathless. So it's hard to exercise. Like what suggestions would you have for them to keep up their energy and their health, but help them to lose that weight that they need to lose? Hmm. That's so, so common for people to be have to get in with that BMI range for a transplant, but they're just having such a hard time. And I mean, it is so hard to get any activity when you're feeling very breathless. So that's super understandable. Um, I usually do default to the plate method when I talk to patients like that, making sure to get lots of fruits and vegetables and kind of fill up on those first so that they fill you up, but they're not super calorically dense. They don't have too, too much energy. Um, so going for the fruits and veggies first, having a good source of protein and some healthy fats as well. So protein could be meats, could be nuts, beans, lentils, those are the kinds of foods that are gonna keep you nice and full. And then some healthy fats, so maybe that's fish. Nuts are a healthy source of fat as well, not butters. Those can all help to keep you full and keep you from overeating. Sometimes patients that are trying to lose weight will skip meals and they'll only have one or two meals in a day. And um, I definitely don't recommend that. I find that it's much better if patients have, you know, multiple meals and snacks that are smaller throughout the day just to keep their energy up and make sure that they're not overeating later on because they've missed a meal. So those regular meals and snacks throughout the day, not too big, lots of fruits and veggies, and then some good pro protein and some healthy fats as well. Okay. Uh, another person wanted to know, Elizabeth, is you know how if you're a diabetic, they have this thing called a diabetic um, cookbook. It has all sorts of great recipes for you to do because you know, a lot of times it's, it's hard to eat the same thing over and over again, right? It's just really boring, really hard. Um, is there such a, a recipe cookbook out there that you could recommend or, you know, point to maybe some other cookbooks out there that um, people could try out and, and, you know, help themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I think that finding a cookbook that you like is a great idea because there are going to be so many great options in there. 
totally agree that eating the same thing over and over is very boring. And you're also not going to be getting all the nutrition you need if you're just having the same foods over and over. A resource that I really like is, I think it's called Unlock Food. It's run by dietitians. And there's a whole bunch of information that's reliable about different health issues, different nutrients, fiber, sugar, and you can also find great recipes there. So all different kinds of foods for all different backgrounds, um, smoothies, things for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. So Unlock Food is a really great resource that I turn to all the time. Okay. Uh, someone just said that um, they've been taking the antifibrotic drugs and they've lost 40 pounds and they just don't know how to gain back some of that, that weight. What would you recommend? Yeah, that the loss of appetite is definitely very common and losing weight when you're on that can happen really often. Um, again, this is where I turn to what I call bang for your buck nutrition. So making sure that every bite that you do have, even if your appetite is small, is as nutrition packed as possible. So again, if you're having yogurt instead of regular, have Greek yogurt because there's going to be more protein there. If you're having a piece of toast, put peanut butter on it, put butter on it. Again, staying away from water because that's going to be filling you up without a whole bunch of energy or nutrients. And then opting for milk, opting for juice or an Ensher drink. That can also be a helpful tip. Um, again, eating on a schedule. So making sure that you don't skip meals setting an alarm on your phone to have, you know, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, so you're not missing any opportunities to get a little bit of nutrition in. Um, and also not uh, relying on your own hunger cues, because those are probably never going to be super accurate and, and um, you can't re rely on them as well when you're not super hungry. So making sure not to skip meals, having those opportunities for nutrition throughout the day and uh, turning to those more calorically dense and, and foods higher in protein as well. And those boosts and entry drinks can also be really helpful if you feel that you need a little top up here and there. Okay. Um, we have someone who wanted to know, uh, they have found that some ready-made pasta sauces affect them more than making their own from canned tomatoes, causing nausea and vomiting. Uh, is there a spice or a preservative that people should be aware of in those ready-made uh, tomato um, sauces, pasta sauces, that might affect people on antifibrotic drugs, particularly OFEV? Yeah. Again, it is super personal. So if you notice that certain brands of tomato sauce affect you, definitely stay away from those. When you can make your own, it's always great because then you can tell exactly what's going into your food and you know exactly what to avoid and what to add. There's no specific spices that I can think of that would, that would trigger everyone. Again, it's very personalized. So if you notice that a certain spice is bad or good, add it, eliminate it, whatever you need to do for yourself. Um, again, like cooking your own is great because then you can, um, you can see exactly what's going into it, but a lot of people don't have access to the ingredients they need to cook those foods or they don't have a kitchen space or they don't have the skills. So turning to those packaged foods is definitely totally fine as well. Um, but overall, very individualized and choosing the things that work well for your body and staying away from the ones that don't can be helpful. Okay. Um, someone also wanted to ask you, uh, because they live alone, uh, they usually go out and, you know, buy something to eat. Um, are there anything that you could recommend, you know, for, for general restaurants out there that you would say, you know, these are, are good things that you could sort of pick, or is it just something depending on how they are, like, you know, what they're allergic to, what they want to eat? Is there any recommendations of of foods that they should avoid when they're going out eating or foods that they can just say, yeah, that, that's something that I would recommend. Yeah, I love the idea of going out to eat when you, when you live alone. And I think it's kind of the same thing, going back to those foods that you know you tolerate well, staying away from the ones that you don't. And um, even like having a friend over, or in that case, if you're living alone, setting alarms on your phone to remind you to eat, um, that can be helpful as well. Okay. Um, I'm just going to ask the audience if they have any other questions. Um, I know I, I do have one more from another person. Um, they wanted to know, you know, because of the weight loss and the general lack of energy and everything, even though they've taken what you have said, boost and all those other drinks, it's still not working. Like what else can mm -hmm. they do to try to um, keep their weight up and their appetite? Yeah. 
So yeah, you have all those different options that we talked about before. So making sure you're on a schedule, really packing all your food as much as possible with nutrition, having those Ensure and Boost drinks. If you really find that those things aren't working, it's really important to get in touch with your healthcare team, let your primary physician know or someone else on your healthcare team, because sometimes there can be things that are underlying. Maybe you're working as hard as you can to eat as much as you can and things aren't changing. Um, so important to address the root cause sometimes and let your healthcare team know so that they can get you the attention that you need in that case. Okay. Uh, do you know from your treatment with uh, working with patients, uh, are there any particular foods that you should avoid uh, between being on profenadone, which is Esperit, or nitinidin, which is OFEB? Is there any particular foods that you say that if you're on this drug, you know, you should avoid some of these foods. And if you're on that drug, you should avoid some of those foods. There aren't any that really come to mind. The one thing is grapefruit, just because that can make your medications a lot more available to your body. So you can actually absorb more than you're supposed to. So grapefruit is one thing to definitely stay away from when you're on medications. Beyond that, it's mostly just personal preference and personal tolerance. Um, when you're on immunosuppressant medications, which are not like the OFEB and the Esbria, you want to be really careful with food safety. So cooking your meats really well, not having any cheeses that have molds in them like blue cheese, um, not having any raw fish, but that's sort of for those anti or the immunosuppressant medications rather than the antifibrotics. For those ones, I would just kind of do personal, personal tolerance as well as eliminating grapefruit and keeping alcohol to kind of a minimum is also important. Okay. Um, so I want to know if you're on these medications and all of a sudden you've developed an allergy, should you go see an allergist just in case? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that going to an allergist can't hurt. It's not going to, I mean, knowledge is power. So it's always good to know more than to not know enough. So I think that that would be totally, totally acceptable and a fine thing to do. Checking in with your physician and seeing their opinion on that and also the severity of the allergy could also be a good step to take in that, in that regard. But I don't think that going to an allergist would be a bad thing. Okay. Um, are there any more questions from our audience today? Well, that's great. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your presentation. I, I've learned a lot. I know so has our audience. And if you could send all those links and those other guides to me, that'd be great because the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation will post them on our website and it'll make a reference to your presentation so that people can go back and view it again and then also go to those links so that they can find some helpful uh, ways of, of navigating this uh, minefield that some people feel that they've gone into because of the drugs that are on the medication. Absolutely, yeah, it's definitely a big challenge, but I hope that everyone uh, learned something and going forward, things will get a little bit easier. All right, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I wanna thank Elizabeth McLeod again for her wonderful presentation. So for those of you who are interested in watching this again, just go to hopereesehere.com and it should be there on Monday and you can review it at your own leisure. And then uh, by then we should have those links up for you as well. And then you can uh, then, you know, check it out. Thank you so much. Have a great day to everyone. Thanks everyone.